there are many different roles to play to change the world. You know, it's an ecosystem of us and you need to figure out which role you want to play, which link in the chain you would like to be um, so that you can give your all, give your best and not be frustrated. Welcome to Happiness for Humanity. I'm Rania Badruddin, the happiness consultant from Egypt. Join me and my guests for an hour of meaningful conversations for a happier world. Joining me today is Shireen Tadros. Shireen is Deputy Director of Advocacy and Representative to the United Nations for Amnesty International. And she's the author of Taking Sides, a memoir about love, war, and changing the world. Shireen, thank you so much for agreeing to be my guest on the podcast. Thank you for having me. I really look forward to this conversation because uh, I'm really intrigued by, first of all, the shift that you made from being a war correspondent to being an advocate, uh, an, an activist, I guess. Uh, so it's up to you how you want to take us, take us through the story. But I think uh, the audience would love to hear about how you made that shift and how yeah. has it been since as well? Right. I mean, I think there's there's a lot of memoirs out there about journalism and even war journalism. And I think that at the end of the day, the way that mine is written is in very much the perspective of someone who's left that job, who can really be very poignant, honest, raw about, um, about the great things about journalism and the incredible, challenging, terrible moments um, as well. So yeah. I, I think that's what sets the book aside. Um, and I think I could not have written it while I was still a journalist. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's a very raw account of my life, the, the, the great, the good, the bad, and the very ugly. Um, mm -hmm. And in fact, the first sort of prologue or first chapter starts exactly with me, you know, talking about um, one of the worst, you know, moments of my life um, when uh, I was uh, pretty much left at the altar by my fiance and I felt like my life was starting to fall apart. Um, and, you know, 24 hours later, I'm in the London office of Amnesty International begging them for a job. Mm. So in hindsight, it actually was a good turning point. And, you know, like, like so many of these events, right, you you look at them from the outside or at the, in the moment and you think um, this is the worst thing that could have happened. And then many years later, um, you realize that how much strength it gave you and how it mm. all, you know, worked out for the best. Mm, yes. So I, I know that uh, one of the reasons you you didn't want to be a war correspondent anymore is the frustration associated with that. Is that correct? Yes, I think that, you know, a lot of us go into these jobs, whether it's advocacy, activism, um, journalism, because we, we, we want to change the world and we identify that there are things happening in the world that aren't just that there's inequality and we're trying to address that in our way in our in our in our in, in our work as well um i think that what the book says is there are many different roles to play to change the world you know it's an ecosystem of us and you need to figure out which role you want to play which link in the chain you would like to be um, so that you can give your all, give your best and not be frustrated. And I think my realization was that journalism wasn't my role, um, that it was it's an important role. Don't get me wrong. I don't think yes. ch change can happen without the kind of very brave reporting that happens. Um, but it wasn't what I felt like I wanted to do. Um, and yes. when I realized that after 10 years, <laughs> there was no turning back for me. Mm. And so now you feel what you're what you are doing is more aligned with with who you are, with your skills, with sort of your interests. Yeah, I think that I, you know, I think put very simply, I sleep better at night and I and I don't have the guilt issues and the sadness that I had when I was a journalist. I mean, I remember one of my last and this isn't even in the book, but I remember one of my last um 
my last trips with Sky News was to Yemen. And I did this report um, about this young girl and, and you know, the war that is raging on now continues, um, you know, was, was just sort of at its start. And it was taking such a huge toll, especially on, on, on the kids um, that didn't understand this, that didn't know what was going on, that were losing parents and families and so on. And I did a report on her. And I remember leaving Yemen, getting on the plane and and my boss, you know, messaging me going, we're not going to be able to, to to play that report today because there's I don't know what going on in Iraq and we need you to get to Baghdad, please. And I said, but if I get to Baghdad and I file from there, I'm not going to be able to file another story from Yemen. You know, the story that I just filmed. And they're like, yeah, we'll we'll do that one another day, another. And I just remember this tremendous because the news brain in me knew that this attack in Baghdad was the story. That's what people want to see. They're watching the news. Um, but something else in me felt so completely, you know, apart from just guilty, just useless. And what? <laughs> but this uh, this is really important. This is so important to her. She gave me everything. She gave me, mm. she, she cried her eyes out during that interview. And for, for what? I mean, and, and you know, I, I think that I just couldn't really live like that anymore that wasn't my my mandate should not have been to tell everyone what was going on in the world my mandate should have been to try and fix what was going on that I could see yeah. and and yeah. and when I when I realized that I realized I just became increasingly frustrated with journalism but as I said I, I do think that you know the brave work that journalists do especially you know the, I have friends that have have lost friends and limbs and their sanity and all of this it is such a hard job um and and you know coming at it from where I am now as an advocate at the UN we really couldn't do what we're doing without the journalists essentially bring the stories to to the top and creating that kind of pressure that we then as advocates you know feed off and, and use almost like you know bullets in, in a gun that you know to, to make change and 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 so I, I always say I don't think I've ever appreciated journalists as much as I do now as an advocate mm. but that just wasn't my role yeah no no I understand uh, both roles to me I mean are so admirable and uh, we need them both but I think there's beauty in the story as well just for anybody listening it's it's just about what works for you uh where you think you can give your best uh, you know make the biggest change and i and i think it's great that you you found that uh i i wanted to read a tiny bit from an article that uh, an article of yours in the new arab it says children with white dust in their hair and blood on their faces the sounds of sirens and men shouting looking for those buried alive amongst amongst the rubble, pictures taken from above of entire neighborhoods turned into slabs of concrete. These are the images of every Gaza war. Uh, so I know that you, you've, you've seen this many times, you've seen this many times before. For some of us, we only saw it this time or really got closer to it this time. Uh, even if we had seen it before, it was not you know, in our in our faces as much, which I think is a good thing because, you know, maybe now there's something positive going to come out of it. If we can say anything positive can come out of something so horrific, but more awareness around what's happening, hopefully, will lead to a positive change. But what was it like to be there? Because you're actually in the middle of scenes like that at some point, right? Right, yeah. So in 2008, um, Israel launched you know, sort of the, a, a big war called Operation Cast Lead um, in Gaza. And it was the last time that journalists were prevented from entering um, or exiting. <laughs> and um, the territory was completely sealed off. And there was a quite a, a limited compared to what's happening now, but a ground incursion. There were subsequent wars after that. But after that, journalists were allowed. Journalists, you know, could report from inside the territory. And I was there again in 2014. And, and, and then again, I think it was 2016. Um, but, you know, there was no ground incursion as well. So this war right now, I think, is very, very... Um, similar to to 2008 more than the other gaza wars that that happened after that um so it's um it, it's it's eerily and and very sadly familiar and um you know my my heart has bled really for for the last six months seeing what's going on um i feel like 
everyone I know in Gaza has knows someone who has been killed that's in their immediate family. Every single person I know, every single place I went to or visited, be it uh, the hotel I stayed at or a restaurant you went to or what you know the sort of shambles of coffee shops and so on that exists in 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 Gaza has been demolished. Um, and every day I get texts and WhatsApps and so on from from people and friends either there or have, have left sort of, you know, saying, do you remember this person or do you remember this place? It's gone. Um, and it's it's really sad and frustrating and heartbreaking because. You know, I remember Eamon Mohideen and I covered this war in 2008 um, and we were the only English speaking correspondents at the time able to broadcast to the outside world because of the restrictions that Israel and Egypt play, placed um, inside of the Gaza Strip, which said that no journalists could come in. And I remember at the end of the war, sort of all these journalists coming in and going, yeah, but was it really that bad? And, you know, I think that the the numbers are inflated because they're Hamas numbers and all mm. the stuff that we hear, you know, we heard during, you know, this round as well. But this was 2008 and it's 2024. You know, I mean, mm. I think, I think maybe what some people miss is just like what people in Gaza have been through. You know, it's crazy. It's, 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 it's it's, it's, it's just unimaginable. Crazy. And this yeah, yeah. in between, it's not like there was like, oh, they it was wonderful and a wonderful life. The economy was booming. It was a siege and an occupation and you could not go more than, you know, there's this is a 42 kilometer, you know, strip of land and you cannot, you cannot exit. There's nowhere to go. I mean, talk about claustrophobia. Um, and, you know, everything is restricted coming in. You're not allowed to leave. You know, you don't go to Gaza and go, so how, how's it been? How, where have you been? What have you been doing? What do you think they've been doing? And where do you think, and no one's let, you're not allowed to leave. Does anyone mm. understand that? I mean, I have, a, I, have, I have colleagues that are complaining that the embassy has kept their passport for a couple of weeks extra. They feel like they can't move. I mean, what's it like to spend, you know, all that time your, your your entire life in a in, in a tiny confined area completely trapped like that and then be bombarded every few years and then this and then this the last six six months you know of 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 fighting and bombardment and you know it's it's yeah. it's unimaginable and it's and yet so it's happening <laughs> And and yet it's happening in front and there are cameras and you know videos and everyone can see it and yeah. I mean, um, you you also mentioned something in this article, which is very true, which uh, I don't know why this is still happening, but you say war crimes aren't context specific. There are no valid war crimes. They are never justified. And yet we see continuous justification for war crimes. Uh, so yeah, what what are you currently doing with your work at Amnesty International that you think, you know, is helpful in the situation or or do you see hope do you see a, a way forward it's really hard i mean you know yesterday there was uh, you know some hope in that you know we we worked very hard um as as you know diplomats did and and other ngos and, and advocates did to pressure the security council into taking some kind of action you know six months in and they had not passed a resolution in the Security Council calling for an immediate ceasefire, which, you know, you can certainly say that this is something that, you know, what does it do at the end? It's a resolution. But, you know, the Security Council must do something, must act. Otherwise, all the other things that happen after that can't, you know, are stalled. Um, yeah. And that kind of pressure and accountability can't build. So it, it was one step yesterday that there was um, a ceasefire call. It was, you know, under, you know, it was it was meant to be just for Ramadan, and we have two weeks left. So there's, you know, there's 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 you know limitations to that. But just the fact that the 15 members of the council, I mean, the U.S. abstained, but still didn't veto it. Um, sort of said, you know, enough is enough. This war has to end. Israel must allow humanitarian aid in. The hostages must be released. 
I mean that that was a that was an important moment of the world sort of standing up um because what it takes for a resolution like that to pass is you know all of these diplomats going back to their capitals going back to their prime ministers and their presidents having this conversation and taking a position that yes Israel must stop and yes there must be a ceasefire so that that is what happened yesterday it's not just about yeah passing a resolution it's about um it's about consensus within the international community that israel must stop and it's going to be increasingly isolated um yeah. by everyone and then the next the next the next you know stages of that which is our job to push for is implementation of that ceasefire accountability if there is no implementation of that of that um, resolution and and to continue to build up the pressure and we do that through our advocacy but we also do that through our research and there's you know uh, many reports um that are in the pipelines for amnesty and for other organizations that i know as well and you know we we also have um today at the human rights council this special rapporteur um on israel and the occupied palestinian territories is releasing her report where she makes a determination that genocide is being committed uh, by Israel or you know that there's credible evidence for that so we are building mountains of evidence and we are moving moving the bar i mean i cannot imagine that we could have been using the g word um yes. in 2008 and 9 even though you know i personally did a story on the samuni family where you know it's more than 20 members of the same family massacred um you know, by Israeli snipers and a bulldozer that went through their house. Um, and this wasn't a mistake. This was over the course of four days where they continued to bombard and, and nothing ever happened, you know, let, let alone, you know, we, we, we determined this as, as something, as cleansing and so on. Nothing, nothing. There was no accountability for that. So, you know, I do think that we have moved, um, we have moved the bar. The conversation is growing um, and people are using words like apartheid, genocide, ethnic cleansing in a way that was was absent before. Yeah, for sure. Because also, I noticed when you use the word war, a lot of people have an issue using the word war uh, because war, I mean, I actually don't know the, the actual definition of war. I wish it didn't exist. But my understanding is it's supposed to indicate, you know, equal uh, kind of power, um, and that's certainly not the situation. Uh, I mean, you have it's it's not it's not supposed to include civilians in the first place. So yeah. I mean, what we're seeing now seems very far removed from what war is supposed to look like. I, I think the war shouldn't have to exist, but but there are you know it has there are certain laws, right, for how yeah. war is supposed to exist. Yes, I mean in international law we call it armed conflict we don't call um we, we don't say war so that's okay. just a more colloquial way of saying mm. it but and you know and the truth is that war is never equal right because if it was equal yeah. then it would just be perpetual war and and no one would ever win and I, and I remember the first person telling me that was um an israeli official when i came out in 2009 and i was saying you know this was so unequal and you know you can't compare your side to the mm. the palestinian armed groups and and he was like well of course of course not do you think that war should be equal because then who's how are you going to win so um you know like the, the the ugliness of this is is the inequality i think that the um, the problem is the way in which the story is told um yes. by journalists which try and equate them and sort of say oh this many people died here and this many people died here and this many people this this and this so there's a yeah. constant sense you know to try and level out a conflict which is not level um and in so doing um what's lost is the truth yes and this brings me to something else uh, i'm reading a lot from your article because just because i love a lot of the things you said but it says the prevailing rhetoric will have you believe that you are either pro-Palestinian or pro-Israeli, with us or against us. It is a sad and damaged way to look at the situation. The truth is, that is not your only choice. You can be pro-humanity and believe in every person's equal right to live in peace and dignity. So this, uh, this podcast is called Happiness for Humanity for a reason. Actually, this was all triggered by the, the October 7th events and what was going on afterwards. I, I was going to be launching a different podcast and then mm -hmm. I realized, uh, no, I, I'm not going to launch uh, Rania's happy hour. It was supposed to be. And it was mm -hmm. more about your individual happiness. And 
you know, and how to achieve your goals, of course, work through your traumas and, you know, mm. but then achieve your goals and so on. But I realized I don't want to just talk about our individual happiness. I, I want us to start addressing humanity as a whole. Where are we? I mean, we're very far removed from happiness for all of us. Uh, but I think we need to talk about happiness in that context, because if we talk only about happiness for the individual, well, maybe I'm happy if I see all these people leave this land because I want to be there. I mean, so it can't just be about my happiness. We've got to start to to take the conversation to uh, collective humanity. Uh, so I that's what I wanted to talk to you about as well. I mean, things like love and justice and and collective humanity, where these are important things to talk about, and we don't talk about them enough. We don't. Uh, we don't even pick each other's brains about them enough. So if I was uh, just going to throw that ball in your court, what do you think about any of those things? Yeah, I mean, I think that my book is is like it, it is really is really that epitomized, right? Like I that's that's what I throw in there, the 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 love and the humanity. I think that um you know, it, it's like we're we're so, we're so criticized in the human rights field because we're sort of seen as naive um, that we think that everyone is born equal and that everyone should have the same rights and but I think that's such a cynical way of looking at things and I think that the bar is very very high for us as human rights advocates like our job is literally never done right you know it's never it's never going to finish mm. um there's never going to be a time where I can just sort of tie a bow on my my job and go, okay, well, I'm going to move on now because that has been achieved. Um, so it's really hard in that way. So you have to sort of look at the small wins. Um, but I, 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 I look at everything in terms of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, which is a document that, you know, 75 years ago, everybody, a, a group of people, and then increasingly all other states of the of the UN joined in and said, everybody is born free and equal. Everybody has the right to basic rights, right to live, um, right to live in peace, right to education, right, you know, <laughs> right to live. Um, all of these things should be, you know, how, how we've turned that into these are just ideals and they cannot be met it's that's a really sad state of affairs but that is really what was decided after the second world war that was the decision made by world leaders that in order to stop you know these terrible events from happening again like the holocaust and ethnic cleansing and so on what we need to do is give everyone these rights and if we can do that and if we can ensure that that will ensure that we don't have these mass atrocities um and it worked for a little bit of time and then now we're right back there um yeah. where you know we have american presidents that are trampling all over everyone's rights um unapologetically and without fear um so i don't know what that says about those of us who are in this field um i i spin it to my staff that it means that we need to we can't take our foot off the brake or, you know, we must continue to work really hard. Um, in my low moments, I think that it shows, you know, considerable failure of the human rights movements to really champion and make everyone understand the importance of universal human rights, that you can't live in a vacuum anymore that you know you live in your house and you have your job and you make your money and and then that's going to be fine it's it's not i think covid showed us that you know we are yeah. all interlinked and no one is safe until until you know everyone is safe well no one's going to be free and and happy until you know everyone is free and happy and and that's yeah. the truth yeah absolutely i i i totally agree i this is why i decided to do this podcast as well because i wanted to have these conversations and I was just like, either I'm going to be just sad and miserable and frustrated, you know, that, that I can't do anything about this, or at least, at least if we can be active in our own way. So this is my own way of being active, have the yeah. conversations, 
because it's easy to to just feel like hopeless sometimes but i mean if if the people who want to to be humanitarian if the people who want what's good for collective humanity are going to be quiet then then we're never going to get anywhere right so we need those voices to rise we need those voices to be heard which is why i, I was so excited that you uh, are going to be with me on this episode because for sure you're a voice that I would love to just help spread even a little bit further uh, because it's we've been doing things in a certain way for the longest time. Look where we are today. We're, we're at a place where literally unimaginable things. I mean, we've all seen horrible movies and this is like worse than any of them. And it's not a movie, it's real. So until until when and to what end and how are we just going to sit around and watch this? So I figured at least let's start, you know, <laughs> talking about it those in positions to actually be able to do something they do their part whatever that is I yeah. think that's the only hope really yeah <laughs> and and I would you know I think that that's that's a great way of looking at it and I think that you know it's really commendable because I think in these moments of of great you know sadness and hardship it's easier to kind of retreat and just stop watching the news and yeah. and I certainly did that you know when the attack happened on October 7th I had just um, started my maternity leave and I had a three week old baby. And part of me just thought, I, I don't have it in me right now to, to check the news and to be present and really feel everything. Because if I feel everything, I'm going to collapse and I need to take care of this tiny, tiny baby. Um, and I think I, I sort of use that for, for weeks until I, you know, something inside of me just said, I, I can't be sort of absent in this moment. And um, I just kept saying to myself, there are others who are doing this job and they're doing it well. And, you know, you can just bow out of this round. But eventually I felt like I couldn't and I just broke my maternity leave. And, you know, my baby was two months old when I was starting to do live shots and, and write articles mm -hmm. like the one you read and so on, which was dictated. Um, over Siri because you know I had a baby um and and very little help um so so you know I I think that it's up to all of us to do something because the truth is that if all of us did something the world will change and if and you know if if we decide to to not do something if we decide this is too hard this is too difficult then nothing will change it's really that simple and that's also the message of the book and I say you know I, I started with a story about my maternity leave just to say that I myself have these moments right where I'm like I can't deal I can't watch I can't there will be other people who can do this and people will even tell me like Shireen just you know it's fine you enjoy your baby and like but um I, you know, I, I still believe that we all have a responsibility at whatever point we are at in our lives, whatever job we have. And that doesn't mean I'm telling you to quit your job and join Amnesty International and go to the United Nations. I'm really not. But I'm saying that ev all of us in some capacity have to do something. And if we all did something and if we all cared enough, then then things will change. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, congratulations uh, on the, being a mom. Is this your first baby or? Yes. Oh, okay, wonderful. Yeah, that's uh, I I have three kids and a grandchild, so oh uh, it's it's a uh, tough it's tough but uh, very fulfilling as well. So congratulations on that. And yeah, I totally agree. I mean, we have to take care of ourselves as well. At the same time, we are capable of doing something, uh, and I think it's up to each one to figure out what it is that they yeah. can do. Um, even if it's hard, I mean, we can do hard things as well. So sometimes we think we can't. Uh, we can do things even if they're hard while taking care of ourselves at the same time. So, I mean, I think people, if, if, they, if they're not able to watch as many things or if they need to, you know, tune out of social media for a while, that's fine. You know, you need to listen to yourself, obviously. But, but if we can encourage people to you know, just find their voice and use it, really, you know, yeah. that's it. I mean, yeah. because uh, that's what it's about. It's about voices. And yeah. everybody has some special skill set, something that they can put out into the universe in a positive way. Uh, so that's uh, that's it. That's the thing to do. Uh, and if there are some days that are sort of slower than others or you're just not up to it, that's fine. We we have to be compassionate with ourselves. I mean, if, we, if we're trying to 
sort of imagine or manifest even a compassionate world, then obviously that includes us as well. So I don't want to be like pressuring people, but we can, uh, you know, just encourage them. Uh, I, I was reading a review as well by Emily Bowles uh, about your book. And she says, from writing policy briefs and showing up as a correspondent on the front lines to standing up for human rights on a global scale, Tedros shares lessons that demonstrate how critical it is for everyone to discover the power they have to choose to make a difference. And so that's that's also an important thing is it's the choice first. And yes. this is what we can sort of encourage people like, just make the choice to make a difference. And of course, there are so many things that, you know, aren't are wrong really with, with what's happening in the world. There are many different countries where things are happening and we can't all, or I mean, maybe we can, but it's hard for us all to take on all of those sort of causes. So it's just making a choice to, to take on a particular cause or to, yeah. to, and then, and then to figure out once I've made the choice, okay, now what does that mean to me? What am I going to do? And then just continue to wake up and make choices. I mean, in all areas of our lives, obviously, because we, we have to make choices in all areas of our lives. But if we can add humanity to our choices, I think that that's uh, that's what uh, that's what we're saying, I guess. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's definitely the, the message of the book. And the book really tries to explain my my sort of coming around to this and how my thought process evolved to understanding what I should be doing, what my role should be. And in, in a way, it's trying to, you know, get whoever's reading it to that same conclusion about their own lives. Yeah. And that book is available on Amazon. So literally people can order it wherever they are in the world, right? Yes, it's on Amazon. It's on World Bookshop. It's um, it's in stores. It's in Diwan. Um, ah, right. it's in Diwan in Egypt. Okay, in great. Egypt. Yeah, so you should be able to find it there. Um, and yeah, and there's um, the Taking Sides Instagram account as well, which just tells you also has some links as to where you can find it. But, you know, I really, you know, I, I wrote it to try and um, get people to people who would come up to me and say, I really feel like I want to do something. I'm not so sure. What do I do? And, you know, it, it's really trying to, you know, guide you um, as to what, what what is it that we need to do to change the world um, and, mm. and sort of inspire people that they have a role to play and that they can they can do something. Um, yeah, I, 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 I'm going to read it. I haven't read it yet. I've read a lot of things that you wrote or things about your book, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go get it from the UN. I wasn't sure... Uh, if I was going to order it online or or what, but uh, now that I know it's in Duane, I'll do that. Yeah, uh, I think we can all benefit from reading this book, and um, and I think it's about us realizing that even if we're you know this small in terms of the world population, we're still somebody, and every every one person can make a difference. So I think uh, people uh, you know can keep that in mind as well. You're from Egypt, right? Yes, both my parents are Egyptian, and I lived in Egypt um, just after the the 2011 revolution until um, until I moved in 2016 to come here and join Amnesty International. So wow, so you picked a, quite a difficult time to be living. In Egypt. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So I mean, I was I was working at the time for Al Jazeera, and then so I and then Sky News, and so you know I was living in Egypt because uh, for, for work, and I covered the the uprising, um, and then. You know, and 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 that's a, a big part. A big part of this book is actually, and this is why it's available in Duane, and why there's interest in it in Egypt is because um, there there is a good chunk of it. It's, I mean, I would say if there was two big chunks of reporting, it's 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 Gaza and about the Egyptian uprising. Okay, so, interesting. Um, it will be. It's it's definitely relevant for this moment, and and so mm -hmm. much of what you um so much of what you have said is sort of the conclusion in the epilogue. So I'm sure you'll read the epilogue and it will sort of speak to you because it, yes. it's almost the it's almost the exact same sort of speech that I give people at the end. Ah, uh, really? Yeah. Well, I, I'm sure it will because just from from your Instagram account, I realize that okay, I want to talk. I want to have a conversation with you because. As you said, actually, one gets tired of sometimes speaking in this way and being called naive, you know? Yeah. So so when I come across somebody who, who I feel shares these similar, you know, values and uh, 
and speaks up on similar things, then like I, I, I feel like okay, I want to have a conversation with this person. So no, definitely, I'll, I'll go out and buy your, your book. Uh, people, who, anybody listening in, please check it out as well. Uh, I'm yeah. sure it's fascinating. Uh, you're yeah. in New York now. You live in New York now. Um, yes, I so I'm in New York, um, near the um, UN. So um, ah, yes, yes, and I've just I've just sort of gone back to work now after six months off. So I'm. So, picking back up but it was okay. you know it's my second week back and we you know we have a a ceasefire resolution at least um adopted yes. at the security council so i i feel like um i i got sort of a good entry back in yes we, the, like we say in egypt <laughs> <laughs> i like to think so i did tell them that <laughs> i'm not sure i can claim i'm not sure i can claim yeah. an entire resolution but, but um <laughs> But yeah, every that's the point, right? Is that every little bit helps and every person yes. helps. Absolutely. Thank you so, so, so much. I I really enjoyed having this conversation. Uh, I'm sure uh, people who are listening or watching us today will have found something to to take from this conversation and and maybe do something with it. That's uh, that's what I would love. Uh, actually, hear it and maybe be inspired, but actually also take some sort of action or make some sort of choice or decision. That would be great. Um, this episode will be available very soon and uh, I'm excited uh, for it to come out. And Shireen, do you have any last words that you'd like to say? Well, I, you know, the, the postscript is one page long. I wonder, you know, should I read it? Yeah, sure. Um, it's, it's, it's short and it's very conversational. Yes, please, please. We all ask children what they want to be when they grow up. We almost never ask them what they want to do. Too often, we don't ask them to think about what contribution they want to make to the world or empower them to believe they can change it. Changing the world seems too large a task. Society tries to shame us into thinking we're naive or even attempting to make a difference. That is for others to do, those with power and influence, not us normal people. I grew up with this mentality watching reporters on television thinking I could never be in their place, seeing starving kids in Cairo slums and feeling that something was wrong, but that it wasn't in my power to change it. But over the years, my work has taught me that even if your role appears tiny and inconsequential in comparison to the magnitude of the situation you're trying to affect, everyone can play a part in changing the world. It just takes enough of us to care. My life did not go as planned. I'm not married with three children, nor am I a doctor or a lawyer or part of the other approved profession so often prescribed to aspirational women from immigrant families like mine. But by accepting who I am and recognizing the part of me that longed to dedicate myself to activism, I changed my life and found fulfillment. I even eventually fell in love again, this time with someone who makes me feel consistently valued, understood and safe and whose two wonderful children have transformed my life. I am surrounded by love, have a deep and honest relationship with my parents, and a job I passionately believe in, even if I often still think I should be doing more. I don't have the perfect life or career, but I have found happiness by being honest about what I want, making choices in the absolute belief that although I am only one person, I can make a difference, that I need not be a bystander, that I can be someone who strives to change the world one small act at a time. Beautiful. That's so beautiful. I love it. Thank <laughs> you so much for reading that. I'm glad. I'm glad you did. Ah, yeah, that uh, it really touched me. I'm Thank so you so glad. much. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and giving me this space. This was a perfect way to end the episode. Thanks again. And uh, everybody listening in, I'll be back with another guest soon. Thank you, Shireen. Thank you, Nanya. Take care. Thank you for tuning in to today's episode. Join me every other Thursday for a new one. Happiness for Humanity is available on YouTube and your favorite podcast platforms. If you found this episode valuable, please share it. Let's come together for a happier world.